So I'm Dave Thaler from Microsoft. Um, so I am one of the members of the BPF Steering Committee in the BPF Foundation, and I've been doing IETF RFCs for something over 25 years, and so I volunteered to help with the eBPF standardization effort. So let me first talk about, uh, give a brief summary of some of the recent discussion, right? We had a uh, meeting on the BPF office hours time slot, and here, so here's some of the outcomes of that meeting. Uh, there's a goal that says we wanted to have, and this came up at LSFM and BPF, as we wanted to have a set of standards documented for around BEDPF. Uh, we have multiple runtimes, we have multiple verifiers, we have multiple compilers and so on. It says, well, it sure would be nice if we could actually write down what the standard is. So as we have different implementations of things, they can all adhere to the same standard so that you know compilers can generate stuff that can be used by multiple runtimes and so on. And so in that discussion, we said, we'd like the documentation to be upstreamed into the Linux kernel tree, right, which is where it kind of is right now, among other places. Uh, but we wanted the eBPF Foundation to then publish a PDF with version numbers, so like a snapshot of stuff with different version numbers that says this is the standard as, as published by the eBPF Foundation. Okay, so there's the source code that's in there, the source of the documents that's in the Linux kernel tree, and then the PDFs being the actual published standard, if you will, by the eBPF Foundation. They said the eBPF Foundation would kind of host this effort to document things, but that we would continue to use the BPF mailing list for our communication. So we said, well, what would we actually standardize? What would we actually document? And so there's a bunch of different things that came up, and we said we were going to start kind of bottom up. So the things that we were going to do first would be the instruction set architecture, the L format, BTF, some of the verifier expectations in terms of what does the ISA cover versus what does the ISA not cover and their verifiers responsible for, and similarly, compiler expectations. Okay, so we're going to start from the ISA first and kind of move up the stack, and then eventually we get to other things, maybe like uh, program types and map types and so on that a number of the people in the community are actually arguing for. From a user perspective, they actually want the bottom ones, but we said we're going to kind of start from the bottom and work our way up. So that was the recent discussion that we had. So now moving on to uh, since then, since we had the meeting, what, uh, a little over a month ago now, there's work in progress. Um, I tried to post to the BPF mailing list, but it ate my mail back last Friday. So I reposted again this morning and hopefully it all made it through and you, you can find it here. But instruction set.rst is the file that's in the Linux kernel source tree that had uh, an ISA, which was uh, had maybe I don't know if it's errors, but it certainly was incomplete. And so we've had many other sites that uh, have been shown up that have had various variations of the instruction set documentation. We're trying to, kind of to go through all of those and collect the information and then update the original one. Um, because we want this to be a cross-platform standard and published in PDF, right? my goal was that the RST should be renderable in as many different RST viewers as possible. Okay, And so one of those being GitHub, and so I did a uh, copy over into a GitHub repository that I have this my personal repository there so I could see how GitHub would render things. And so that's the copy that I've been iterating on to make sure that it would render right in, uh, under various RST viewers. Uh, and so I posted the mailing list. There's a GitHub diff that's like the diffs in the current version against the um, latest one, but then there's also the uh, Git format patch that was sent to the BPF list. So whichever way you like to see it, you can see the rendered copy. You can see the diffs in GitHub version if you like that. You can see the diffs in the format stuff if you just look on the mailing list. So my proposal is that once the stuff is eventually upstreamed into the Linux kernel, right, that the docs themselves be mirrored into a GitHub repository. Right? We do this for a BPF. We do this for a BPF tool. This then helps other consumers that aren't, that aren't Linux to be able to consume those same sorts of documents and use different tools. So. The eventual goal is that I mentioned that the BPF Foundation would then publish the PDF, right? And so how do you generate the PDF in the RST? Well, you put the generation tool over in the GitHub mirror, okay? Similar as how we do with libbpf and BPF tool right now, with a mirror repository just contains things specific to the mirror repository, not the authoritative sources, right? So that's the eventual goal in, in the proposal here, is to say we're going to create this GitHub e uh, repository under eBPF Foundation, and that's where we'll have the BPF generation, or the PDF generation, and the published PDFs. Okay, but the point is you can actually see a rendered copy right now that I'm gonna show you a couple things from. All right, so this is the current, so so far all that's in there is the ISA, right? It's just the modifications to instruction set at RST. This is the current table of contents as snapshotted in the rendered version. 
Okay. And see, a lot of those are in the one that's in the Linux kernel repository, which does not have the table of contents in it. We just added this to the RST. And there's a couple of additional sections here that were missing in there that were copied in from various other sources, right? You remember yesterday there was a presentation that referred to the instruction set, but it actually linked to the pchango version of the GitHub docs elsewhere, not the Linux kernel one. That's one of the many sources we use to pull together from, from this one. I say we thank you to uh, Quentin and Jim for generating actual reviews and code and for people like uh, Christoph and Dave Tucker for uh, generating um, mailing list discussions in the past that we used as sources. So. And by the way, part of the point of this is to call for additional volunteers if you want to help with this, whether it's for ISA or for any of those other categories, please just contact me. Uh, we'll get you set up. All right, so let me talk about a couple things that are already in the diffs, okay? And then there's a couple of open questions that I would love feedback on or reach out to me afterwards, okay? So the first thing, this one came up at uh, LSFM and BPF, which is it's pointed out that it said nothing about overflow, underflow, or divide by zero, and that's probably the lowest hanging fruit to go and fix. And so uh, the text in green there is what it says right now. If you think it's incorrect, just tell me what it should say, right? But it's better to put something, right? That's the trick in standards documentation is you put something down, and if it's wrong, people will tell you, and then you can fix it. So that's the, that's put in there. Uh, so you see, program execution must be gracefully aborted, that's what it currently says on divide by zero, okay? But it doesn't actually yet, one of the gaps is, it doesn't say what gracefully aborted means, okay? The previous doc, if you look in the Linux kernel repository right now, there's a similar statement talking about the uh, legacy packet instructions where it says, if the EBFF program tries to access the data beyond the packet boundary, the program execution will be aborted. It doesn't actually say what will be aborted actually means, right? Does that mean you return back to the caller? Was the return code? It doesn't say, it doesn't cover that, okay? And so uh, the point is that's another gap that we need to figure out what's the right thing to say there. So if you have thoughts on that, uh, text contributions gratefully accepted, uh, explanations on mailing list welcome too. So. Uh, so that's what it says right now. So that's one step that's improvement. Um, one of the other things that people were asking for popularly was to have a table of all the opcodes because you can kind of derive it from all the other information, but having a quick lookup table. This is in the appendix because this is not what's uh, authoritative. What's authoritative is the text in the body of the document. This is the summary at the end that says, if you just want to know what opcode hex 15 means, here is the simple place to find it, and you can then have the link that jumps back into the document that contains the formal definition of it. And so if you're just trying to say, what is that bytecode right there? Well, look it up in here, and then you can jump to the correct section of the document. So it's all the ones in here. I just snapshot just what would fit on the screen here, but it continues on all through the rest of the opcode space. All right, so now I'm going to go through a number of open questions, and uh, I'm hoping we can have some discussion, because otherwise this will be real short. So, uh, all right, so here's some open questions. Now, you'll notice... Uh, I thought there was another slide in here. Well, I'll just talk about it then. I think on uh, when I thought there was a different slide. Okay. All right. So in the document right now, because it's a standard that's intended to be cross-platform, okay, right now it uses the standard types UNT32T, etc., not U32. Okay. Now, of course, in the Linux kernel, we always use U32 and so on, okay? So here we have a Linux implementation note that says in the Linux kernel, UNT32T is expressed as U32 and so on, okay? And explains that since this is a standard document, that's just what Linux does. Other platforms could have different variations of that, okay? The point is we put in a Linux implementation note here. So the question is, in a standard here, do we want to include Linux implementation notes and CLang implementation notes, okay? Right now, the answer is yes, it does, specifically for things like this, in order to translate between what was in instruction set RST before and what would be in a cross-platform standard. But you can say, okay, if you have a Linux document and you have the eBPF standard, right, should that be the same document or two different documents? Right now, the proposal is it's the same document with just Linux implementation notes in it, okay? You don't have to have one that refers to the other, but you could argue the other one too. But right now, our approach is... Anything that was in there that was really specific to Linux is now in a Linux implementation note that looks like that. And uh, also across the different um, other instruction set documents that were out there, there was a number of CLang implementation notes. 
And so we put those into notes that look like that. So for example, how you determine whether you have the 32-bit AOU operations, here's the Clang implementation note as to how to do that, okay? We could have dropped that. We chose to put it in there because it was popularly referenced in their documents. So if you have feedback on that, but right now the proposal is yes, and it will look like that. Different question would be, so what happens if we wanted to have, you know, GCC implementation notes or Windows implementation notes? Do we add that into there or is that out? Open question, if you have thoughts on how to do that. Uh, right now, the straw man is Linux and CLang is in there, and other ones are kind of open as to whether we keep those in or out. Okay. I'm going to keep going, but these are things that I would love feedback on, because otherwise, I'm just going to make some arbitrary choice and hope that Joel can live with it. So um, by I, and anybody else is contributing and generating uh, pull requests and things. So, All right, so the next interesting question is how do we deal with input arguments to eBPF programs? Okay. So on Linux, right, you just have one register used as the input argument, but that's a convention, right? That does not necessarily apply to other runtimes. Windows follows that same convention if there's only one, but if you look at like UBPF, right, because one of the people that's uh, reviewing the uh, stuff is one of the UBPF maintainers. UBPF actually differs, we learned, this is surprising to me, between the JIT compiler and the interpreter in UBPF. One of them uses one argument, and the other one uses two arguments, okay? Which is the second argument is the size of the context field, right? So the first argument is always the same, but it also has R2 that's filled in with what's the size of the point of the structure pointed to by R1, okay? And so right now the uh, straw man is to say, what if we say that it looks very similar to how helper functions work, okay? Where the helper function, can vary by platform, but the details of how many different arguments there are in this meaning is up to the helper function. Okay. We could say, well, it's actually up to the program type, and by just so happens that all the program types on Linux and technically on Windows all have a single argument. But some runtime could define program types where the, where the number of arguments vary by program type, just like they vary by helper. That's the straw man that's in here right now that says this seems to be fairly flexible without actually making anything invalid and probably would even cover cases like, you know, UBPF and any other, I don't know what HBPF does, the one on offload cards and so on. So, um, so previously in the document, it talked about um, that the Linux part about there's only R1 um, was just in the body and we moved that into a Linux implementation note because we found cases like UBPF that I mentioned, which actually did not follow that convention. Okay. So we said, well, the standard is kind of the lowest common denominator, and the note about only using the one is kind of a convention used by Linux that not everybody apparently uses. So that was news to me. Uh, yeah, so you can see uh, the actual number of registers used and their meaning is defined by the program type. This is the straw man. A networking program might have an argument that includes network packet data and or metadata. We tried to copy language as close as possible out of the other documents if it wasn't already an um, instruction set, RST, then one of the other things that was listed as a reference. Now I get to the two most difficult ones. Okay, so here's one, legacy packet instructions. There is text that's in there right now, um, and I'm not sure that it's right because there was discussions on the list over the last year about what to do with this. So right now, the, what the document does is it says, well, let's try to abstract it from Linux and see if, it, what, see if people like it, right? Because we could just remove it or whatever else. So what it says right now, okay, and the red parts is the most interesting parts here. So I'm just gonna look at that. So legacy packet instructions are ones that actually, the instruction set architecture knows that there's a packet that's there, okay? It says when the program context contains a pointer to a networking packet, so what the original doc said is it had a, you know, an SK buff, right? Well, SK buff is inherently Linux specific, right? But basically anything with a networking stack has a networking packet and something that actually contains a pointer to it, okay? So if you said, well, what would another runtime do with that instruction if it ever saw it? It wouldn't have an SK buff, but it could still do something? Absolutely. It would just have a different offset or a different structure, but it could actually find a data structure that's in there if it was doing the, the instruction set architecture, okay? So it says, okay, if you can tell that the program context contains a pointer to a networking packet, then the legacy packet instructions could, in theory, make sense. You see, R6 is what has the, the context. It says, a pointer to a context structure with a packet data pointer. Okay, now, 
in previous documents that said contained a pointer to you know an SK buff or whatever. This is an attempt to abstract it from saying SK buff to something where SK buff is a Linux instantiation of the 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 the, the packet data structure. So you can see the Linux implementation note that says, on Linux, that thing is an SK buff. Other proposals that came up on the mailing list was, well, should we just um, remove the stuff and say these are deprecated and they don't mean anything, or they're up to the implementation, up to the runtime, you can do whatever you want with these things, right? Which probably is less interoperable than actually the approach I tried to take here. Another variation um, where uh, this was the the, posting on the mailing list between, I think it was uh, Jim Harris and Kristoff, um, where you know maybe you do it as an extension or something like that. And you can have different things that claim to support an extension. Right? So far in the ISA document, I don't have anything that's the concept of an extension, if we could. And so whether you think it should be uh, moved to an extension, whether you think it should be you know, deprecated, whether you think it should be implementation defined, or whether you like this approach that says, well, it's just kind of generified, even though it's deprecated, right? Such that the instructions could be used on some other runtime. Um, this one, I guess, is my preferred approach, but I don't feel strongly. So if somebody has a strong opinion or a good reason to not do it this way, just if there's something broken here, let me know. Uh, but this is one of the things that um, uh, is kind of a big open question because there was this discussion on the list that hasn't really been resolved. Right? So I'd love some People have strong yeah. opinions on this one. Yeah. You, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. So I was, I was wondering, um, so with the escape buff, I think there's not always a guarantee that the data packet, network packet data is going to be linear in that buffer. So I'm kind of wondering if there's an implication that we're adding here by saying this is a network packet. Like, are we saying it's a linear set of bytes and so on? Like, So it actually looks at the offset and then it also can copy stuff from the nonlinear data. But I don't know. I would. Do you think like if we don't even mention it that uh, we would still comply, <laughs> like um, comply to the standard, or would we have to when we want to create a standard, uh, make an exception and say there are some you know deprecated implementation specific uh, exceptions like you know like this one here that you just show? Yeah, you can see you know the end the state. I don't remember if this one was Jim or Kristoff. Mm -hmm. It might have been Kristoff that said you know the standard might say implementation defined meaning that different runtimes don't have to support them. But if it's implementation defined, that means that your compiler can actually generate something unless you have implementation stuff in the compiler, right? And so, uh, you know, not sure what to do there. Especially so you start having other compilers well, besides the, you know, <laughs> This and part, like, yeah, I would leave it, like I wouldn't put this kind of stuff into a common document. I would just say yeah, implementation defined without going to the details because it's, then like, yeah, what does this keep with this linear or not? It's like way yep. too many questions. Plus we don't really abort. So same for the divide earlier, which is already a bug in a, a document, like divide doesn't do any abortion, it just like returns zero. So what are we arguing for here? Are we saying to uh, make them be implementation defined, deprecated? What yeah, like just implementation defined. Like Because just saying it's undefined would also be not quite correct. <laughs> uh, like we are, like on Linux, at least it will stay this way, this BPF in the app's ugliness. So yeah, just say implementation defined, but don't like, um, it's just like, I don't see the value of define, like defining them in a standard. Uh, two other hands up, so, okay. Uh, Hello. Uh, thank you for having to actually discussion. This is what I wanted. So, yeah, I, I have one other big question, too, but let's get to this. Feedback on this one is, like, super valuable, and then I have one more after this one that I would love to have discussion on, too. So, yeah, please. Yeah, so, so if we make this implementation defined, does that mean an implement, implementation could come along and we use the opcodes for something else, or would we want to say yep. this class is actually reserved, you, you shouldn't use it for anything, and... Like, I guess it kind of goes to the question of, do we specify the full ISA and say, you're not allowed to add your own opcodes to it? Or can an implementation say, how? Oh, I kind of want this nifty thing here. Yeah, but I mean, my, my personal, yeah. I would prefer if we said, don't put any of this in and just say, these classes are not to be used and other things will have to be documented later or specified later. 
Yeah, it, uh, I think that would be consistent with saying they're implementation defined and deprecated, meaning nobody should use these for anything, right? Some implementations did, but you know, compilers should never generate these in the future, right? And uh, you get what you get if you try to use them. You can't rely on it being interoperable or whatever. So please don't use them. But some things did. Yeah, so we can yeah. can say like reserved, I guess. Yeah. Well, so that means like you shouldn't implement because it's not specified what it is. Or, Reserve still encourages people to squat on them. And so I would say deprecated, please don't use kind of thing. It's, it was, so I, I mean, like we can leave the note that like Linux historically supported yeah, yeah. it. But like that's definitely a legacy that like we yeah. wouldn't implement if you were yeah. like implementing from scratch. Okay, so I want to come back to that, but I can go here. So I, I came in a little late. So I probably missed something. So my question is like, is this program type part of the standard? I'm asking because this is kind of, well, to me, it's like a, you get a, con a program tab, you get a context like this. It's kind of tied together, right? I'm going to ask you to hold that question until the next slide, okay? As I said, there's a second thing. I'm going to come back to that, and it's going to be very relevant to the next slide. So I did want to answer um, uh, one point on Andre's thing, which is um, if this gets removed from this document, okay? So if I go back to the slide that talked about um, uh, this one, okay? Today, this is um, being done as a uh, replacement for instruction set RST. In other words, these are patches that would actually modify that file. Okay. Now, if we remove it, that means that there is no file that actually documents this stuff. Okay. So that means maybe we do want to have a separate file that contains Linux specific you know, extensions just to use, I think it was Christoph's term, right? It says, okay, maybe the, the legacy ones move into a separate file, this Linux deprecated extension, something like that. So the instruction set becomes the generic stuff, and then a separate one has deprecated stuff that's Linux specific. I'm a bit worried about like extensions because that sort of will encourage other implementations to start creating their own extensions, and like that's probably what yeah. we don't want. So it's like maybe Linux specific, historical, or whatever, yeah. whatever, but like not an extension. Yeah. I, yes, I agree. Baggage, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, I have uh, one more question regarding the. Regarding the um, division by zero, uh, can we just standardize the way what we currently have on Linux? Does there speak anything against that? I mean, uh, if somebody wants to write up text and submit it to me, uh, then chances are yes. All right. It's what? M meaning set the return code to zero in return, or what? Oh, just set the set the value to zero. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Yeah, see, I didn't know the answer to that one. So I, I, if, you, if you tell me what it is, I'm happy to put it in. Yeah, if you yeah. said divide by zero equals zero and then continue on uh, instead of gracefully aborting, then yeah, happy to change it to that. Yeah, I mean, like, we, like for, for the case where we cannot verify it at uh, load time, then you know, we adopted the same thing like ARM64 did. So to not throw an exception because yeah. you know, when you have BPF to BPF calls, there's a certain return type expected. Now, when you have like some kind of abortion, then this like you know conflicts with the verifier, for example. That's why we you know did that. Yeah. So my preference is to yes, let's have the same behavior across runtimes and standardize it. And if that's what the answer is, then let's just make sure that UBPF and other runtimes do the same thing. So we we got a UBPF maintainer on the list of stuff here, so we can get those changed. So. Yeah, so what what happens with the like the second part packet boundary like when has data beyond the packet boundary isn't that like the statically verified? Uh, the, I'm telling you the, the what the document says right now. What happens? I can't comment on what the document says right now. You don't now, have abortion, you, right? Is so. that you you gracefully abort? And I think in somebody's presentation, maybe it was yours, talked about you know, like detaching yesterday. Um, if you see something weird happen. Yeah, that's yeah we don't have graceful abort yeah yet like as what daniel explained like there's no way to yep. well that's why like we change divide to do this like it just like region zero and continuous because we cannot just like exit <laughs> yep um Okay, so the, the, the sentence at the bottom is the one you're talking about, and that sentence is actually in the legacy packet section. So if we take that out, then that part gets resolved too, right? By just moving into the um, legacy section, although the legacy historical note or whatever we call it, however, will have to fix that sentence, right? It just won't be in this. Yeah, part. even if you move, it's probably better to like specify what actually happens. 
All right, so I want to get onto my last slide, and so this will get to your question about program types. Okay. Um, the other big question is, uh, here we go, other wide instructions. Okay. So Quentin nicely posted a pull request to the uh, IOVisor UBPF docs that had a, a bunch of great reference information in there. And so there's other um, sort of 128-bit um, instructions or wide instructions that use uh, additional information. And you can see a little snippet here from um, what's in Clinton's pull request. And so all of these, the definitions of, that now use the source register field in addition to the you know, immediate or whatever fields uh, to distinguish what that um, instruction does. You can see the definitions, at least in his write-up, it uses things like um, you know, map FD, uses BTF ID of variable, map index, uh, BPF callback, and so on. None of those terms are mentioned or defined in the instruction set. Okay. So here's an opcode, or at least a, a, an instruction type, that has a particular meaning that is specific to you know, BTF or maps or so on, where the instruction set does not define the concept of a map. Right. That's at a higher layer. Okay. So here are we polluting the instruction set with these higher ones. How do we deal with this issue? Right? We have sort of upwards dependencies in the layer that says the instruction is defined to mean something about a map that has no notion in the instruction set. Okay. This is the one that I'm really scratching my head. Just says, okay, what do we do with this? Okay. Because these things will be defined in other documents, right? But do we have sort of upwards uh, references or what? So I'm looking for ideas on this one because your point about does it define program types? No. There's no definition of program type in the instruction set. Okay? That's a higher layer on top of the instruction set. Should there be? Well, you tell me it's the same as the answer to these. Should there be a concept of a map FD in the instruction set? Okay? Or is that a layer on top of the instruction set? Right? I would have previously, I, I didn't know about these instructions. They're not in the instruction set RST right now. Right? That's why Quentin sent the, the, the pull request. Right? Um, is none of these things are mentioned there. Do they need to be? Well, it's because instruction set by itself is not sufficient, right? So, like, you'll need yeah. to define, like, the environment. Yeah. So, but here are the specific, I mean, opcodes are, are semantics of opcodes that actually depend on these other concepts. That's what's weird in these wide instructions. This doesn't exist any place else in the, in the opcode set other than right here. Like, we, we do expect to document the, like, environment, sort of, like, the higher level concepts as well, right? So yeah, yeah. If there is some reference to an existing higher level concept, as a temporary solution, that probably is fine, no? Yeah, I mean, a couple of these, there might be a way around, sort of, like if you look at, let's say, the top two, right? You can just say uh, destination equals the immediate and destination equals the immediate, but it means that the immediate is a map FD, okay? Well, if the instruction set, you know, if the instruction set, you know, interpreter or, you know, runtime, doesn't know the difference between an integer and a map FD. It's at, that's at a higher level. You could collapse the instruction set definitions of those first two into the same meaning. They mean stuff different to the verifier and the JIT compiler and so on, but the instruction set architecture, they mean the same thing. You're going to do the same thing with the registers themselves, right? Uh, with the top two. So maybe there's a way of trying to splitting that to say there's things that are maybe verifier, et cetera, expectations versus things that's just what do I do with, with, the, with the registers? That's my only thought off the top of my head, but other than that, I, I'm looking for ideas on this one, so. Okay. Just, so let's go back to your question, so I'll just kind of come back to you, because you, you want to talk about program types, which is kind of in the same category as us, all these other things down here, like MapFD. So I kind of think they're different. Well, like maybe just my, my understanding may not be the same <laughs> as others, but I think like uh, map ID, BTF ID, like a program ID, or index or ID, or like a callback, I think that's gonna be a BPF program ID. I think that should be part of the instruction site. Well, program type is kind of something we can take out. It, yeah, you can argue that the program type is a lot easier to deal with. Um, at the instruction set definition level. Um, yeah, it, I mean, that, it's ideas. So I, yeah. I don't see a way to take them yeah. out. We want the ID yeah. in the instruction. I think I think that's right. I think uh, I think there's a good argument that you're making that the program type is more like a um, more like a helper ID in the sense it defines a prototype and some semantics to go along with it. Just one is calling in, one's calling out, or whatever. And it does talk about um, helper IDs because there's the call instruction, right? And so you have to document that. 
And so I think the, the notion around, uh, like back here when we talked about how many different input arguments here, um, you know, where we have program type. So I think we could deal with program type fairly naturally. It's the, it's the other ones that's like, you know, map FDs and so on. Does that have any impact at the ISA level? So yeah, I think you're right. So we have a comment from the chat. Max Tottenham says, is this not similar to how the x86 ISA defines the GDT for the load GDT instruction? And I take that to mean maybe say these other bits, if source is not zero, then to be defined later, I guess. <laughs> okay. What do you think? Uh, I don't know the specific example he's talking about, so but uh, suggestions appreciated. So if if that translates into you know a particular way to word this, that's fine. I just don't know the spe that specific example. So. So one of the one of my concerns and the reason why I put in these uh, instructions to uh, Dave is that the document otherwise specifies that the um, fields uh, that are unused by the instructions, so the um, source and destination, and offset um, fields in the iconic of the instruction, are to be set to zero if we are not using them. So if we keep uh, that uh, constraint on the ISA in that. Linux uses some uh, some source field, for example, for this instruction in particular. And in that in that case, we're not strictly compliant with the uh, specification. Yep, that's right. And just to repeat that, um, these wide instructions are not currently compliant with instruction set RST. Instruction set RST right now disallows these wide instructions that have been implemented. Right? Meaning we got to fix the instruction set RST. Right. That's what, that's the point here. Couldn't we say, like, for the specification, I mean, I mean, to abstract this, you know, concept of FD away and saying it's like a non-zero identifier and whatever it, it, that, that means is, like, platform-specific, I don't know, like, how it looks in Windows, actually. You also have, like, file descriptor that you pass down in there or something else, or... Um, to, to answer your question about uh, Windows in particular, um, in... Uh, Windows, there are um, IDs, so like a map ID is the same, um, but the FD, whether it's, you know, uh, maps or anything else, FD has no concept in the kernel. It uses a handle. Um, in other words, it's a, you know, 32 or 64, depending on the architecture, bit number, um, rather than an integer, right? And so it's up in user space is where you have a mapping from an FD as used by, you know, CLibs into a handle. And then the handle is what's used to transition across the user kernel boundary. And so in the kernel, it's all handles only. And so the FD doesn't actually have any existence in the kernel, right? IDs do. And so IDs is what's actually stored just like in, in Linux. So. so in this case, we have like a non-zero ID for an object. Of a yeah. map. But here we have to define a map object at the ISA level, yeah. as opposed yeah. to defining it over in a different document that that sits on top. You know, the map types and program types. And there stuff. is also a very strong assumption that this whatever FD or ID will fit in four bytes, so that probably should be part of the specification, and that will cause yeah. troubles to Windows. But that's you know, life. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay, so we're about. Let's see, we've got about uh, two minutes, I think, left in our usual time. So if we still have another question or comment, we can go for more, because this is really my, my my last slide, right? So if there's any other comments on this one. So I guess right now I like the suggestions, maybe if there's a way to say, uh, the, the ones that introduce these other concepts, if there's a way to say that uh, they're maybe up to the implementation, maybe we could do something similar to the legacy ones, but that says it's, it's more like legacy and varies. So if you have a compiler that tries to generate, you know, source equals, I don't know, let's pick four this time, right? Where BPF func and the instruction offset of BPF callback, right? Well, what does that mean? Can we write that up in some generic fashion? Or is that something that says, well, if you generate that, it's going to be inherently runtime specific, right? It's going to only work on Linux and not UBPF or HBPF or Windows or whatever, right? Um, or is there a way to abstract that that encourages it to be implemented the same way by multiple runtimes, right? Um, which then makes it much easier to do compilers because now you can write it once and it doesn't matter that you have more portability. So if somebody's familiar with those and, and wants to take a shot at saying, well, here's what the generic version would be, then we can maybe figure out what document it would go in, whether it's this document or whether this is um, create some slots that may be plugged in by higher level things that says, here's the map specification and the map specification uses, you know, the 
you know, source equals two here and source equals five and six with the following meanings. So maybe just like worded generically that like LD im64 with like non-zero source is used to refer to some entities defined by the environment. Like, and you know, just refer to it and like yeah. get something about it. And then like that will be specified by the environment specification. Um, sure. I'm mean, saying you can do that. I'm saying the only disadvantage is now if it's specified by the environment, that means if you're writing a compiler, then you can't generate these instructions unless you know specifically which environment it is, right? You have to turn on an option that says, oh, I'm generating it for Linux, so please allow it to include these instructions. I don't think Clank right now generates anything, like it generates zeros, and then we have a relocation, and then it's up to like libpf, for example, to fill it in. So compiler doesn't know about any of that, I think, maybe about the function of set. I would love to have a compiler person tell me what Clang does. I mean, because this is generating the SR, the, the, the source value, right? The, the, the value in the source field of the, of the instruction. So um, similarly, if there's a way to turn on and turn this off and say LLVM to say generate or don't generate, you know, sort of like the plus ALU32, if there's a way to do that, it might be useful. So I'd love to hear about that. So. But I also wanted to check about the uh, input arguments. Like, should we specify actually that it's only one R1 for the context and that's it? Because otherwise, similar as with extensions, right? Like some custom implementation will go crazy and like specify up to five input arguments. Oh. This one I do have an opinion on, um, only because, uh, so at first that was, that was my original thought and I actually wrote it that way the first time when I was updating this section. And then the different reviewer said, this is actually not right. Did you know that that's just a convention? So I learned, because I thought that this was kind of baked in and everybody did just one and that was just how it was. Um, and what I learned is that's not the case. People don't do it that way. And in fact, there's no real reason for that um, other than convention, right? And so that's why I specified it this way. It says, okay, if somebody wanted to define, you know, program types on some platform and maybe want to have new program types on Linux, but somebody else could have program types, right? That's not part of the ISA. And they wanted to say, it's gonna vary by program type, just like the number of arguments varies by um, helper function ID, right? They could do that, it would actually work, so. No, I didn't see Yeah, but do we want to create this divergence? That's the question. And like, that's the point of the standard to actually keep it like uniform and simple instead of like, because you know, like it, it will go into the area where like, oh, it's implementation yeah. defined and like it's unspecified, like with C undefined behaviors and that is yeah. crazy. So the, the, because I was arguing exactly what you were arguing uh, before, now I'm trying to channel others, right? So um, keep, keep that in mind. But um, I think one of the arguments that I heard was, if you think about the UBPF example, that says if they use R2 for the size of the structure pointed to by R1, okay? That actually makes a number of things be a lot easier, right? And so I say, no, you can't actually use R2 that way, then it may prevent some implementations on some types of platforms or compilers or something. So. Uh, again, that's I, I, I'm not authoritative on that part. I'm just kind of relaying what the feedback that I heard was. So, so something to think about. So I don't have a strong feeling on this one. Like I said, I, I originally wrote it the exactly as you're saying, and then I had to change it. So, all right, I think we're about out of time. But um, anybody else who wants to participate in this effort, either post the list, send me email, comment on the uh, private or my personal GitHub repository right now. Um, uh, thank you for all the feedback. Great stuff. So.